Hey everybody, good morning. Welcome this Monday, February 21st to the Morning Devo with bo -O. Super stoked to be here on a Monday with you guys. Yeah, lately, as you guys know, I haven't been in on a Monday, but uh, usually Mondays are my day off. Um, but if I am anywhere around the studio, whether at the office or over here at the house office, I am in the Devo because I'm going to do it because I need to get in the word in the morning. And hey, why not just join in with all my cool friends online and uh, and get into it. So you could always check out their live on YouTube and on Facebook on my YouTube channel at Bo Willette. And um, all the archives are there as well. So these devos are relatively just chill out devos, getting in the word, going through the Bible. And uh, if you've never been through the Bible, you probably pretty much dig it because you'll really get the flow of things. Right now, the narrative it really narrows in to uh, the tribes of Israel. And specifically, we're uh, kind of working through a guy named Moses and all that God's doing in his life. And it's pretty awesome. So uh, he is from the tribe of, does anybody know what tribe uh, of Israel that Moses is from? Um, yeah, does anybody know? It'd be interesting to see if you guys know that answer. That's kind of a question for the morning. It might be too early for that. I don't know. But anyway, here we go. Exactly two months after the Israelites left Egypt, they arrived in the wilderness of Sinai. That's right, Bob. Absolutely correct. Bob got the right answer. Bing, bing, bing. And uh, I wish I had a prize, but I, I don't. So they leave, and they've been wandering. And remember, God is trying to get the, if you will, the Egypt out of Israel, working on their character, working on trusting them. Why? Preparing them. For if you want to dwell with God, then you got you to gotta deal with some stuff. You know, God is not like you in the sense that fallen, sinful, narcissistic, sociopathic, <laughs> all the things that we tend to go in into and become very selfish and, you know, self-centered. God is not like that. God as a just being, as God, um, the uncreated being, if you will, the uncreated creator uh, is without any defect and you know, a lot of people always say, oh, man, it'd be awesome for God to hang out with me. Oh, yeah. You might not know God <laughs> if you if you say that, because God is a lot different from us. And there is a, a complete justice with God. Uh, and that complete justice requires righteousness on our part. So he prepares them. He's working on their faith. He's getting them to think about him, to trust in him. To rely on God. And it says, after they left and they went to the wilderness of Sinai, after breaking up camp in Rephidim, they came to the wilderness of Sinai and set up camp at the base of the mountain. So we can understand what that's like. We have the Catalinas here in our area. These big mountains go up to 8,000 square feet. And just think if we camped, all of us camped at the base of the mountain. It says that Moses climbed the mountain to appear before God. The Lord called to him from the mountain and said, Give these instructions to the family of Jacob. Announce it to the descendants of Israel. You have seen what I have done to the Egyptians, how I have carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Oh, what a cool statement verse 4 is, right? It's one of those underlining ones. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I carried you on eagles' wings. Now, did God really carry them on eagles' wings? Well, the answer is no. The Bible uses this kind of um, uh, literature all the time, this kind of writing quite a bit. It's picturing God's hand in our life, God's work in our life, in different ways that we will understand or we will get a picture of it so we can understand it better. Because God is spirit 
And it's not necessarily that we're seeing God. We walk by faith and not by sight, but we describe God's work in these kind of natural ways. And you'll see this throughout the Bible when you read it. Now, this passage is really cool because I love how it just shows the care of God, kind of that parental care, right? You know how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Isn't that weird? I carried you on eagle's wings and I brought you to myself. Did you break that down a little bit? A really interesting uh, picture, right? I brought you on eagle's wings. You're on my back, but I'm carrying you to myself. <laughs> really interesting, right? We get hints of the of the interesting interesting intricacy of God in the Old Testament all the time. God does the work, and yet there is another person. <laughs> yeah, it's really interesting. When, and we've already met some of these interesting kind of phrases, right? The angel of the Lord, who they bow down and worship, who they call the Lord. And then yet the Lord is somewhere else as well. Um, and you see this very uniqueness, quality of God. God could carry them on eagle. He could do that work, moving within their life, moving right there personally with them, yet also be in another area as well. Very interesting. I love that. We're getting carried on eagle's wings by God. Where? To himself. <laughs> wow, that's interesting. Now, there's a passage in the Old Testament that is, or that is in the prophets. It's Isaiah chapter 40. You might want to read chapter 40 of Isaiah and just get this eagle's wings idea too. Very, very neat. Yeah, Bob's got a story behind this. So I'm sure there's many stories behind this one because it's just super cool, right? God loves us. This morning, God sees me, man. He wants to be along with me. He wants me to he wants me to mount up on him like you know on his eagle's wings and he's where is he taking me? To himself. He's with me right now. He's he's in a in a real real way. God is with me. But yet he is taking me to himself, to this place where he is at. Um in in like a totality sense. And I just think that's so Cool. Good morning, Tina. And so it says, now if you obey me and keep my covenant, you will be my own special treasure from among all the people of the earth, for the earth belongs to me. Now notice this. God could make the everybody in the on the earth his own special people. But he takes just a small group of nobodies, really, and he says, hey, I'm going to be your God and you will be my people, but you need to obey me. You need, if we're going to enter into covenant, you have to obey me. You have to trust me. You have to be united with me, right? To keep covenant. To keep, does it sound like another kind of covenant that you enter into in your life? Where you say vows and you keep a covenant and you say, hey, you, you ha we have to listen to one another. We have to be in obedience to the covenant. You know, we have to... We have to be together, you know, in this. We can't go astray. And yeah, this is very interesting, but God is starting to enter into a covenant with Israel, and it's going to be in a, a picture of a wedding covenant. And that, that might sound odd to you guys, like what? You know, yeah, God created marriage and God enters into this covenant with his people. Will you obey the covenant? Will you, and we're going to see what the people are going to say. And we're going to see what the what the what the vows really are here pretty soon. And so um, you see, if you want to dwell with God, you have you enter into a covenant with him. God is a righteous being. And notice how God chose just a specific group of people, not mighty people, not people of noble kind of heritage per se, but just people. And in that neat, God chooses you too, and he picks you. 
and you might not be of noble birth or of an amazing background, but God loves you and chooses you, too, to be a special treasure among the peoples of the earth. And I love that picture, right? A special treasure. Man, you are a special treasure. Oh, the kind of language that is. Can you just, I mean, when you think of someone who's a special treasure in your life, you know, who comes to your mind? People who are just super special. You know, I was thinking the other day, and uh, uh, sometimes as a minister, you have times where there's a lot of loss, and it, there's there's multiple losses. Um, so, you know, sometimes it goes in bunches, like you'll, we'll have five people pass away within a month. And then, uh, maybe a, in a week we'll have a few people pass away and it some, it just happens in these bunches. And sometimes it gets my mind kind of focused on, you know, my own life and people in my life and, you know, especially my spouse, you know, um, Sylvia. And I, I sometimes think like, man, what if I, what if Sylvia passed away? You know, and I, I think of, and then I think of what a special treasure she is in so many ways. What a special gem, man. Super fresh, awesome, the best. You know, just such a treasure. Known her so long since we were kids and just everything we did together, all the dirt we did together, getting saved together and growing in Christ and having kids and man, just crazy. Yeah, I mean, just wild life. And I think, what a special treasure, man, you know, and holding fast to the covenant, you know, learning to hold fast to the covenant. And, uh, you know, sure, I could have married someone else, but I didn't. Sure, she could have married someone else, but she didn't. There was a special treasure, you know, there was a, a choosing, a decision, a volitional decision. And God says, hey, I'm going to I'm choosing you. If you if you think I'm gonna kind of barking up the wrong tree, by the way, in this kind of analogy, you might want to read Ezekiel 16, and you'll you'll get it. Ezekiel 16, you'll see how God sees Israel, and it says, "You will be my kingdom of priests. You will be my servants, man. You're gonna be people that are around me and reflect me and." shine me a holy nation a nation that is set apart as i am holy so you will be holy see if god if 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 everybody in the world is going to hang out with god they all got to be holy they all got to be priests they all got to be a holy nation um they can't any sin man is going to be judged by god if god's going to be hanging out on the planet at all <laughs> yeah I mean, think of that. And God knows that, man, his presence is, is, is means some ramifications for the people of the earth, just his presence alone. And so he tells them, hey, this is what I'm going to make you guys. And it's going to be radical. I mean, talk about a transformation, taking human beings and taking us and moving us to a place where we can dwell with a holy, perfect God. Talk about the power to be able to, to make us right when we are so flawed. You don't think we're flawed? Turn on the news, man. Turn on anything, right? Just pick any kind of reality, something. <clears throat> you watch it for five minutes and you go, wow, we are a mess. We are beyond hope. And that's what we are, is beyond hope. We need a rescue mission. Now, this is what Jesus has come, right? Jesus has come to seek and save that which was lost. That's right. He has come to seek and save. This is why Jesus is so important to everybody in the world to know Jesus and to know about him because he offers a reconciliation with the Father free of charge, man. It didn't, it costed him everything. But it doesn't cost us anything. And that's why the Bible says in Isaiah 55, come buy wine. Come buy bread. You don't even need money. Come buy. You know, why do you guys <clears throat> buy what does not satisfy you when you can come to me and take of the best and for no charge? Yeah, super cool. So you guys are definitely breaking it down in the comment corner. That's for sure. Um, 
Yeah, so special treasures. Sometimes it's our kids. Sometimes it's, uh, uh, I think someone said, uh, I wanted to say daughter, uh, uh, my stepdaughter. Uh, so stepdaughter right there. So there, you know, there's a stepdaughter there. And so, you know, you see there's special treasures, right? So God's going to dwell. You see, you see what's going on, right? God showed himself in various ways to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But now God is going to actually rule over the tribes as a king. He's going to rule over them, and his presence is going to be with them. And as his presence draws closer to them, they must be holy. They must be holy because God is holy. Something's going to happen if they don't be holy, if they don't walk right, if they don't walk in uh, um, holiness, purity. So again, when people say, hey, I want God to show up right now, you don't know what you're asking. It's a misunderstanding of God. It's looking at God as if he were like, just like us, you know, fallen people. God's not just like us. He is holy, perfect. So Moses returned to the mountain and called together the elders of the people and told them everything the Lord had commanded him. And the people responded together. Now notice what they respond. We will do everything the Lord has commanded. I do. You get it? We do. Have you ever said that before? Has anybody ever said that before? Yeah, you guys have said that before. Where you're at the, you're on an altar, you're before a minister, or something like that, and you say, "Yep, I do." Well, the best thing to do is when you say "I do" is to do, <laughs> right? And that's the point. That's what we're trying to do when we uh, are trying to obey vows. We're trying to do you know, the vow. We will do everything the Lord has commanded. And notice that the vows, even in a wedding, are so radical, right? Till death do you part. I mean, those are some radical vows, right? Holy cow, right? Those are some crazy vows. They they seem so impossible. Well, they, they kind of are without really a work of God. You know, they, they're, they're super impossible. But even, even with that impossibility kind of in the vow, we, what do we say? I do. I do. And so they say, I do. So Moses brought the people's uh, answer back to the Lord. And uh, then the Lord said to Moses, I will come to you in a thick cloud, Moses, so the people themselves can hear me when I speak with you. So there's a veil over uh, God. There, there's uh, His presence is there. It's in a thick cloud. Uh, and, and he says, so the people can hear me and they will always trust you. And it'll be a, a, a kind of another sign of God's power. Uh, before the people that God is with Moses as well. So Moses told the Lord what the people had said. Then the Lord told Moses. So God, Moses said to God, they said, I do. And the Lord told Moses, go down and prepare the people for my arrival. Consecrate them today and tomorrow and have them wash their clothing. Be sure they are ready on the third day for the day will, of the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai as all the people watch. Mark off a boundary all around the mountain. Warn the people. Be careful. Do not go up on the mountain or even touch its boundaries. Anyone who touches the mountain will certainly be put to death. Woo! No hand may touch the person or animal that crosses the boundary. Instead, stone them or shoot them with an arrow. They must be put to death. However, when the ram's horn sounds a long blast, then the people may go on the mountain. So there's this <clears throat> wedding kind of ceremony that's starting to take place. Just as there has been an acceptance of the offer of marriage, so now comes the preparation. The presence of the groom is going to come to the tribes. And as it comes to the tribes, there will be a marking off of where the bride is to be waiting, waiting for the groom. And the groom is up. Check this out. The groom is up and the people are going to go up. Wow, interesting picture, right? To meet their groom. And so we see some early pictures, some early pictures of the Jewish ceremony of wedding and very much an early picture of what we call the rapture of the church and 
the marriage supper of Jesus being married to his church. And so we see very similar things. The people are waiting. They're looking up. They're waiting for the arrival of the groom. And there's a boundary marked off. And wow, they're waiting for the trumpet blast. Whoa, does that ring a bell for any Bible students? They're waiting for the trumpet blast. And then when the trumpet blast sounds, then the bride knows that the groom has come. The groom is ready to go. And he is up there waiting for his people. Woo! Man, do you see some pictures here? Wow, some very cool pictures of the New Testament. Uh, pictures of the rapture and the marriage supper of the Lamb. So very cool. And there's a whole studies on that, by the way. And I, I definitely uh, think you should look into that. Um, you might want to Google um, Jewish wedding and rapture. That might be a fun study. You can study what's called the hoopa. Uh, have you ever heard that in Hebrew? Very cool stuff. And uh, where the bride is what? Lifted up. Yep, lifted up, carried. Isn't that cool? Up in the air. Oh, man, some cool stuff there. So Moses went down to the people. He consecrated them for worship, and they washed their clothes. A cleansing, right? A cleansing of preparation. A mikvah, getting into the water. The water, have you ever heard of baptism? Well, here you go, right? Baptism is not a New Testament concept. It is a Jewish Old Testament concept. So Moses went down and he consecrated them for worship and they washed their clothes. They dipped their clothes. They immersed their clothes in water. Uh, the idea in the Old Testament, um, God calls himself the, the Israel's mikvah, uh, which is, means reservoir of hope, water of hope. Right? Something new is coming on the horizon. Have you ever heard a New Te Testament passage that says, All who are in Christ, behold, all things become new. Have you ever heard that? Those in Christ, all things become new. This is the idea that we are, we are cleansing and concentrating ourselves, coming out of the water, the reservoir of hope with a new hope. A new life, right? Uh, that kind of idea. You know, God is our mikvah. God is our reservoir of hope. And they consecrate themselves. He tells them to get ready for the third day. Isn't God amazing? I mean, so many cool things. He says, get ready. Don't abstain from sexual intercourse. Prepare. Get your mind off of just, you know, your physical with your spouse. Because I want you to get ready for spiritual with me. <laughs> wow. That's pretty cool. Oh, yeah, it's very, very neat. You know, God wants me to, you know, and God, what Jesus has done is he's concentrate, consecrated me through the work of the Holy Spirit. He has set you apart for his use. He has washed you in the blood of the Lamb. There's so many cool things, Paula, here. There's so many neat pictures. And anything that you've learned in the New Testament there's so much that's actually rooted historically in these sections of the Bible. And so the New Testament writers, you know, pick up on all of how Jesus has fulfilled these pictures and these types. And, and this narrative that really happened, Jesus becomes the ultimate fulfillment of these things. So very cool. So Jesus comes into our life and he consecrates us. He washes us by his blood, right? And he says, hey, get ready to meet me. <laughs> I'm coming one day. So on the morning of the third day, thunder roared, lightning flashed, and a dense cloud came upon the mountain. And there was a long blast from the ram's horn, and all the people trembled, right? At the sound of the last trumpet, the dead in Christ will rise first, the New Testament book of Thessalonians. And we who are alive will be caught up together with him to meet the Lord in the air. And we shall be with the Lord forever. Comfort one, one another with these words. Man, just amazing, again, pictures, uh, you know, types. Um, a, this, is a, this really happened as a narrative. And we see another fulfillment, uh, a, a type, a likeness to this in the New Testament as well. There was a long blast. The people trembled. 
and, and they feared. Even though the Lord's with them, they feared. Moses led them out from the camp to meet the God, meet God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. All of Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord had descended on it from a fire. The smoke billowed into the sky like smoke from a brick kindlin, and with the whole mountain shook violently as the la- as the blast of the lamb's horn grew louder and louder. This must have been amazing. Moses spoke and God thundered his reply. The Lord came down from the top of Mount Sinai and called Moses to the top of the mountain. So Moses climbed the mountain. Now his reply must have been, I do too. And uh, uh, something like that. But man, a thundering reply. Uh, I've seen some smoke before. And I've seen some fires before. And they can be really, really scary. Absolutely terrifying to watch. And here, this is what this scene is. Um, very, very interesting. Lots to say about it, but I'll move on. Then the Lord told Moses, go back down and warn the people not to break through the boundaries to see the Lord. They are, they will die. So they they will die if they break through this boundary. Even the priest who regularly come near to the Lord must purify themselves. So the Lord does not break out and destroy them. God will judge sin, but Lord, but Lord Moses replied, the people cannot come up on the Mount Sinai. You already warned us. You told me, mark off the boundary all around the the mountain uh, to set it apart as holy. But the Lord said, go down and bring Aaron back up with you. In the meantime, do not let the priest or the people break through the approach to approach the Lord or he will break out and destroy them. So Moses went down and told the people what the Lord had said. So Moses kind of says, hey, I thought we were all going to go up. And and God says, nope, just Moses and Aaron at this point are going to come up. And so there's some stuff that God needs to give them. And we're going to see that it's a special something that God's going to give. It is basically the written vows, you know, of this, this covenant between Israel and between Yahweh. Very, very amazing. Again, read Ezekiel 16. You'll see the passion of God. So this morning, I just want to really think of God's passion for me, that God enters into covenant with me through Jesus Christ, you know, and how beautifully intimate God looks at it. I might look at it as just like, oh, I'm a friend of God, but I'm more than a friend of God. He loves me. He's with me. He's in me. He's upon me. He comes upon me. That's how the Spirit is talked about in the New Testament. In, with, and upon. Those are the words that are used. Very intimate terms, right? He's with you. He's in you. And he's upon you. And, and God has made a way for us to draw close to the Father without dying. <laughs> and it's by the wonderful, perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ. That's what makes us approachable bef- to the Father, or where we can approach the Father. What's called in the New Testament, we can approach the throne of grace. It's by the precious blood of Jesus. What a passionate God What an all-pursuing God. What a God of power that can transform us into people who can be with the true and living God, the creator of all things that are seen and unseen. Absolutely amazing. You guys, I didn't get to 20, but we'll get to that vow. We'll get to those, you know, the, the, the letter of the covenant, if you will, tomorrow. Lord willing, you guys have a great day, okay? Bye-bye.